Hi, I'm Pete, and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. This is the third and final video in our Making Hay series. In this video, I'm going to cover the equipment needed to make hay, a little discussion of round and square balers and how each of them work, how to know when the hay is dry enough to bale, actually baling the hay, and then how to know whether the hay is suitable to put in the barn without it heating up too much, along with lots of video of me doing the work. So stay tuned and let's get to it. I'll tell you what, it's hot. It's great hay baling weather. It's been in the upper 80s the last couple days and that really gets the hay through the final drying phase. I'm going to start by talking about different kinds of balers. We started our farm making small square bales. It was what I was familiar with. We grew up making small square bales and I picked up this old baler at auction. It's a New Holland 269. It was made in the mid 60s. It was a great baler starting out. We started out making about 300 bales a year but what happened is we grew and the last year we made square bales we made 3500 it's just my wife and i unloading them into the barn it was too much so it was time to get a round baler but really quickly here's how the square baler works it's got a pickup that rotates and picks up your windrow it comes into here and there's a set of feeder teeth which go back and forth this way and they push the hay that's been picked up into here which is the bale chamber now in the bale chamber there's a big plunger that rotates around and around here, pushing the hay and compacting it in the bale chamber. And there's a set of hay dogs in here and also a tensioning mechanism on the back which make the hay compact into what they call leaves of hay. And each time the plunger goes back and forth, you make another leaf of hay. The hay comes through the chute after it's been compacted by the plunger. This is probably the part of small square balers that give most people frustration. These are the knotters and it turns out they look complicated but tying the knot in the bale is a pretty simple operation if you look at it in slow motion. There's other YouTube videos that do that. I never had very many problems with these knotters. I had to adjust them a little bit, sharpen the knives. This was a really reliable baler. We started out just dropping the bales on the ground so they'd come through this chute on a tray and then they would just fall on the ground we'd come back later pick them up and stack them in a wagon a couple years in i added this bale thrower which is just two belts the bale gets caught in here and the belts fling them back up into the wagon and up front you can adjust how fast the thrower is running how far you want to throw the bale and you can also point this one way or the other using hydraulics it worked great for a small amount of hay. Making a lot of small square bales also comes with the necessity of having a bunch of bale wagons to store them in. Otherwise, you're baling a load of about 100 bales, then you gotta quit and unload them in the barn and start over again. I would load up all four of these wagons, then we'd pull them up and pull them into the barn, and Hillary and I would unload all four, and then I'd go back out baling. It was a long day's work and really tiring. I ain't getting any younger. Once you hit 50, square bales start to become a thing of the past. So realizing we needed to come up with a better solution, I went to auction the next spring looking for a round baler, and I thought I was going to get an old piece of junk for my budget, which was about $2,000. Well, up came this baler. It looked brand new. The paint wasn't even wore off of the pickup and inside the, the chain drive units it was sparkling clean like somebody had taken really good care of it and stored it inside. This baler was made in the 80s but I guess it wasn't used very much and I don't know why because it works perfectly. It's a Gale 1860 TDC. TDC stands for Total Density Control. And I'll show you how the adjustments. Now the only thing that this baler's got in common with our old square baler is the pickup. I mean, it picks up hay in the same way. It's got a rotating set of tines that pick up the windrow. They're more complicated than I ever would have guessed they would be. Inside here's all the chain drives for the pickup and the belts. This hydraulic cylinder in here is what adjusts the density for the bale, so it adjusts the tightness of the belts. And this is where you actually adjust the bale density. There's a big hydraulic reservoir you can't see over here and another hydraulic cylinder on this side and a gauge for the pressure running through the hydraulics. And as the bale gets bigger, this pressure will be applied to the tension of the belts. These belts are what wrap the hay and run around it as the bale's building up. You'll see that in the field. The best thing about round balers to most farmers is there's no knotters. The twine comes out of the twine box in here and then enters this pipe. This pipe swings back and forth so you can wind the twine around the hay while it's rolling in the chamber. And I do that manually with a hydraulic valve on the tractor. 
you just wrap the bale with twine. Then when you return this to the home position, there's a knife that cuts the twine and there's no knotting involved. And if you look inside this thing with the rear door up, there's nothing to it. There's just these belts which wind around in kind of a complicated way. There's this drum here which rotates that the bale spins on, especially when it's starting out. And then there's a smooth drum in the front that crushes the hay and flattens it and spreads it along the bale. And those fingers that are down right now, the aid in starting the bale. I'll show you more about that when we get to baling in the field. Now I wound up paying about $1,200 for this baler, which I think is a steal. And the reason it was so cheap, well, there's a bunch of reasons. Number one, it makes five foot long bales. And the industry standard now is four foot long by four foot high bales. Because you can stack four foot long bales too wide in a trailer or a wagon and haul them down the road. This makes longer bales. Not an issue for me because I'm not hauling hay down the road very much. I am putting it on a hay wagon, but it's all on our farmland. The other thing that makes this baler less desirable is Gale has quit making balers. They only make construction equipment like skid steers now, so parts are really hard to find. But I have enough connections on the internet with parts salvage yards and things where I'm really not worried about it. One of the things I like about making these bigger bales is I have fewer to handle. Yes, they're heavier, but like when I load them into the barn to feed the cows in the winter, there's a lot less going back and forth with bales. And the geometry in the math is surprising. A five by five bale, which is what I make, has twice as much volume as a four by four bale, which is the industry standard. You'd never guess it looking at the two, but when you do the math, that's what it turns out to be. Another key difference about this baler is it doesn't do net wrap, it just does twine. And what net wrap is, and you've probably seen this in the field, is this net roll that's in the back of the baler and when the bale's done it gets wrapped with this plastic netting. And what the plastic netting does is it makes the outside of the bale very dense so that it sheds water easier and they'll stay better with less spoilage outside. This just does a twine wrap, and which is fine with me because we store all our hay in the barn where it isn't exposed to the weather anyway. Now if you're doing round bales, you have a choice between making dry hay like we do, which bales just like a square baler and then you put it right in the barn, or you can make damper hay, which is called baleage. It's more like silage than dry hay. When you make baleage, you have to wrap the hay with plastic right away. And the reason for that is you want to keep the oxygen out of that damp hay that's in the bale. Then anaerobic bacteria take over and the bale doesn't mold, instead it ferments. And that fermentation will increase the palatability of the hay to the cattle. Bales can be wrapped this way singly and they look like giant marshmallows if they're wrapped this way. Or they can be wrapped together in a line like a giant worm. After baling round bales for a year, I will never go back to square bales. There's so much less manual labor in round bales. And Hillary, my wife, jokes that last year she didn't have to touch a single hay bale, which was a big difference from the year before that. So I make her go out and touch a hay bale once in a while, just to say that she's touched the hay. The big question to a lot of people who are starting out making hay is, how do I know when it's dry? And there's a lot of ways to tell, but the best way is to have experience. Once you get into it for a while, you just know, you know by the feel of it. To see if the hay is dry enough, I pull up a piece of the windrow and I feel it with my hands. There shouldn't be any limp hay, it should all be crackly sounding and it shouldn't feel damp at all. In fact, it should feel warm from the sun with no cool areas. And it should have that dry hay smell and once you do it a while, you just get to know that smell when the hay is ready. The hay can still be green colored. In fact, I like it when the hay is green colored. It just seems more palatable to me, but I've read that there's really no difference in hay that's baled with that green color still in it and hay that's been bleached out of it. What happens is the longer that the hay is exposed to the sun, the sun bleaches that green color out of it. And for this hay, it's been down about four to five days and the dews in the sun have bleached it out more than will be with second cutting where we're baling as little as 48 hours after we cut. Now on to baling and getting the hay into the barn. Baling's just like cutting. All your senses are tuned to the moment. The equipment's working hard and you have to be aware of any changes in its performance. There is no daydreaming. I'm going to show you how a round bale's made from start to finish. This baler makes the core of the bale differently than the outer part. There's fingers that come down between the belts and hold the beginning bale in place while it turns on the rib drum that I showed you that's in the bottom of the baler. 
As the bale grows to be about 8 inches in diameter, the fingers gradually retract and the hydraulic density control system kicks in for the rest of the bale. The hydraulic gauge on the front of the baler will show this. It'll all of a sudden jump up to about 500 PSI. As the hay comes in, it's flattened and squeezed by the top roller, and it also spreads the hay out and adds it to the bale more evenly. And then the belts roll up that hay that's coming in onto the outside of the bale as the growing bale rolls in the chamber. A gauge on the top of the baler shows the current diameter of the bale. I can choose to stop making the bale whenever I want, different from a square baler that ties at a fixed point. As the bale grows, I gotta watch it to make sure it's growing evenly and doesn't get lopsided, bigger on one side than it is on the other. Modern balers have a fancy readout in the tractor cab that shows this, but I use the old fashioned way. I just look straight back at the baler and I can see the bale growing in the chamber. When it gets too big on one side, I weave back and forth across the windrow with the tractor so that the bale picks up hay on the opposite side where the bale is smaller and then when it gets too big on that side I switch it back to the other side and grow the bale evenly that way. It is hot. The thermometer says it's in the upper 80s but it feels like 90s in the field because everything is bone dry including the hay fortunately. Working the tractor with an open cab is not comfortable. You've got heat blowing back at you from the radiator fan in the front of the tractor. You've got heat radiating up from the floorboards and the transmission when it's gotten hot with the hot weather. You've got chaff and dust blowing back at you from the baler. Open cab baling is how real farmers do it. No air conditioning here, no pleasant radio, no cab. We're out with the chaff and the hay, baling in the heat. There's quite a complicated sequence to using an old round baler like this when you finish the bale. When that indicator on top of the baler hits five feet, I stop the tractor. Then I move the twine arm to the center of the bale. Then I drive ahead a little bit and an incoming slug of hay catches the end of the twine on that twine arm and then the twine starts wrapping around the bale. Using the hydraulics on the tractor I manipulate the twine arm so that it goes back and forth across the bale twice and then I've got a twine wrapped bale. Then I return the twine arm to the home position and the knife there cuts the twine automatically and the bale's wrapped. Next, I shut off the baler and back up a few feet. This way any chaff that accumulated under the machine while I was wrapping the bale can be picked up at the start of the next bale, leaving a neat field. I shut off the baler so the belts don't tear at the surface of the bale as it's being unloaded. Then I open the baler's back door and dump the bale, and the bale rolls down little ramps that are fixed to the back of the baler. I make sure I'm on relatively flat ground while I do this, or I've got a bale rolling away. It could hit a fence line, it could roll into another windrow. And after the bale's out, I pull the tractor ahead a little bit so that I can close the door without hitting the bale. And then I'm off again to start another bale. As the baling continues, it's gratifying to see a clean field revealed. And the bale's representing another winter's worth of cattle feed. So on and on I go making bales. And I'm baling three fields today. It's a total of about 15 acres of first cutting hay. I started baling at about 2 p.m. and I finished baling at about 7 p.m a heck of a lot faster than the old square baler. I'm running ground speed of about four miles per hour with this round baler, which is about as fast as I can go in our rough fields. With the old square baler, I was lucky to get two and a half miles per hour on first cutting hay. After the hay is baled, the next step is to get it into the barn. And fortunately with round baling, it's a lot less stressful than square baling. When we square baled, we had to get it into the barn before it rained. And on baling day, rain was always coming, so it was a big rush. Round bales can sit in the field for a while, and they're fine because the way that they're constructed, the rain sheds off of them, or at least most of the rain does. They will gradually spoil on the outside, but if I have to leave them outside for a couple days or a week, it's actually beneficial, and I'm going to get to that, and also it won't hurt the bale. Now, eventually, we do want them in our barn because we've found that we get the most bang for our buck out of hay if we don't leave it outside so that way the whole bale can be eaten by the cows and they don't refuse the outer part that's been weathered from sitting outside. Before I can load the hay and start to put it in the barn, I have to check it to make sure it's not heating up. What can happen if you bale the hay a little too wet is fermentation can start to occur in the middle of the bale and that fermentation's byproduct is heat. Bales can actually get hot enough to start on fire if they're too wet and that fermentation happens. I like to leave them outside for at least a few days because that gives them time 
for me to check whether that fermentation is happening or not. It gives it time to start building up if it's going to happen. So if I leave them outside for a few days and I go out and I stick my hand all around in a couple of bales, I can feel how hot they are. A little warm is fine, but if they feel hot to the touch, they need to stay outside until they cool down. Otherwise, you run the risk of the hay catching on fire in your barn, and then you've got a barn fire. You want to load up and store bales in the barn after the dew's burned off and they feel dry to the touch. Otherwise, you can run into the same problems with fermentation. Loading's a pretty boring job. I drive into the fields with the old flat top wagon, which badly needs a new deck put on it and position it so it's close to four bales because that's a full load for me. I unhook the tractor from the wagon and I load three bales onto the wagon. Then a fourth bale goes on the tractor's bale spear and that makes a load to haul back up to the barn. Once I get up to the barn, I have to unhook the wagon again, bring the bale that's on the tractor up and stack it in the barn, and then it's back and forth to the wagon, getting the bales off the wagon, stack them in the barn. Inside the barn, I stack the bales three high. There's so much of my old junk in here that it gets hard to maneuver after a while, and by the end of the season, the barn's pretty full of hay. So it's back and forth all afternoon to get all the bales in from the three fields that I baled. Here's the hay all stacked in the barn. I wound up having 41 5x5 five five bales out of 15 acres cut, which is a pretty good take. It's about a third of what we'll need for the winter to feed our 35 head of cattle. We have a little bit of first cutting left to start later today or tomorrow and uh, I'm glad that I had a little break here because making hay is exhausting from a mental standpoint, a stress standpoint, as well as from a physical standpoint. This hay took five days from cut to bale which is significantly longer than hay usually takes for us. It's because temperatures were in the 70s until the last two days when it climbed into the upper 80s. As we get on into the summer we usually make hay in between 48 and 72 hours, two to three days and it's a fast drying process. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you tune into our channel for all the other types of videos that we do. We do farm business videos. We do video videos about grazing and our Dexter cattle. Our farm's got chickens and turkeys and pigs on it. So we really like to mix it up. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next time.